Hello, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. It's really wonderful to see so many people here in person today. I'm Lisa Prosser and director of the Susan B. Meister Child Health Evaluation and Research Center in the Department of Pediatrics. And I'm really delighted to welcome everyone here today. This is our first in-person lecture event since 2019, so really delighted to have everyone here. I'd like to start by extending a very special welcome to our keynote speaker, Donna Mazik, Executive Director of the School Nurses Association, and our three panelists, Dr. Tiffany Munzer, Julie Robado, and Dr. Don Purek. Before turning the program over to our speakers, I have a few opening remarks. First, I'd like to recognize an individual who's been instrumental in the development and evolution of this lecture series and also to announce the recipient of our Best Paper Award in Child Health Policy. So I'd like to start by acknowledging Dr. Susan Meister and her vision in supporting this lecture series and our center. This lecture event is named in honor of Dr. Meister, an accomplished child health policy researcher herself. She recognized the promise of an interdisciplinary center for child health services research and policy at Michigan. And for the past 25 years, she has provided crucial support and partnership in helping to develop our center. Her inspiring commitment to multidisciplinary research is what launched this very special event. Our center sponsors this lecture each year, aiming to engage in an interdisciplinary audience in a conversation about pressing issues that call for an interdisciplinary response. So I'd like to take a moment to recognize Dr. Meister and her valued role. If you could please stand. Thank you so much, Susan, for all that you do. Next, I'd like to announce our paper award winner. This prize has been established to recognize an outstanding scientific paper in child health policy by a student or postdoctoral fellow at the University of Michigan. Nominations are evaluated with respect to contribution of novel methods or expanding the knowledge base about a significant clinical or public health issue. The quality of the research and importance of the policy implications are also considered. Today, I am very pleased to announce the 2023 recipient of the best paper in child health policy as Caroline Hogan for her publication titled Perceptions of COVID-19 Vaccine Incentives Among Adolescents and Young Adults. Okay, come on up. Dr. Hogan is a pediatrician currently completing a joint fellowship between the IHPI Clinician Scholars Program and the CHEER Fellowship Program. She's also completing a master's degree in public policy from the Ford School. And her paper assessed adolescent and young adult perceptions of COVID-19 vaccine incentives, was published in JAMA Network Open earlier this year, and suggests that policymakers need to account for youth perspectives and concerns when considering future incentives. And there is a poster here somewhere uh, describing her paper, right here at the front, so you can all take a look at it during the session. So I'm very pleased. I'd also like to take a moment to comment on the interdisciplinary focus of this event. A key goal of this lecture series is to bring people together from across the university and from the broader community to discuss issues in child health policy that cross disciplinary boundaries. Our topic today, the effect of continuing school closures on child health and development, brings together attendees from a vast range of backgrounds with students, faculty, and alumni from across 15 schools and colleges here at the University of Michigan, as well as from the broader community, including local school districts and the Michigan Association for School Nurses. And this year's theme is of great importance as school closures continue for reasons other than COVID. We've seen closures this past fall due to RSV and influenza, due to teacher shortages, and now most recently the local public schools, um, as many of us know, were closed for almost a week due to an ice storm and the resulting power outages. So today our keynote speaker and panelists will consider the longer term effects of these closures, as well as potential interventions as more data emerge. And I just want to comment, it is just especially wonderful to see so many people here in person today. 
An important finding that's come out um, of the use of virtual platforms is that while these platforms can be just as effective as in-person communications for implementation and decision-making for a defined set of alternatives, we've also learned that the generation of new ideas and new alternatives is less robust in a virtual setting, that innovation and discovery require in-person interactions. So it's vital that we all work to reintroduce in events like today that are designed to spark new conversations and new thinking at the intersection of disciplines. So I want to welcome everyone and thank you very much for joining the conversation today. We have an incredible panel of speakers, each providing their own unique perspective on today's topic. We look forward to a lively discussion later in the session. So the format for the lecture event is we'll begin with a presentation from our keynote speaker, Donna Mazik, followed by remarks from each of our three panelists, followed by an open Q&A, where um, we also have people joining us online today, and they'll be able to join the Q&A as well. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today, Donna Mazik, Executive Director of the National Association for School Nurses. Donna has been Executive Director of the National Association of School Nurses since 2011. A thoughtful and strategic leader, she has led an expansion of the influence and impact of school nurses in addressing student and school community health and safety. Major initiatives during her tenure include the launching and operationalization of a strategic plan focused on shared leadership, a commitment to evidence-based practice and data collection, and an emphasis on interprofessional collaboration by school nurses. The creation of the framework for 21st century school nursing defining the role of student-centered school nursing and its complex mix of community and public health, leadership, care, coordination, quality improvement, and standards of practice components. Prior to her appointment as executive director, Donna has served the organization as a board member and as president. Mission-driven, while in undergraduate school, Donna determined a nursing degree would be foundational in her plan to return to her community to help individuals and groups become healthier in a variety of ways. She's been a nurse in community settings for most of her career, beginning work in home care and hospice before moving to school nursing. And she pioneered school nurse roles in a high school and an alternative school. She understands and has lived systems of change and the importance of collaboration across school health leadership. In her role at a state education department, she provided consultation and leadership to local school health services and school-based health center programs, working with government, community agencies, and other stakeholders in the development of school health policies and regulations. She's represented NASN and school nurse, nurses in the Future of Nursing 2030, in the White House COVID Response Focus, and the National Healthy Schools Collaborative Development of a 10-Year Roadmap for the Future of School Health. So it's been really wonderful to have Donna as our guest here for the last two days. She's met with a number of faculty from here and across the university. And what really impressed me was her, um, her comment that within her organization that they're implementers and we're researchers and the conversations that have already been sparked have across these past two days, I think are, will be really important in really both creating and implementing new solutions going forward. So I'd like to now um, welcome Donna Mazik as our keynote presenter today. Well, thank you. It is such a pleasure to be here today. I want to just acknowledge um, those who are in this room, those who are watching via live stream, to Dr. Susan Meister. Thank you for the vision for this interprofessional, interdisciplinary home for researchers and for people like me who focus on implementing. We share the same goal, the health and well-being of children and adolescents. Thank you for investing in this. And to Dr. Lisa Prosser and your team, it has been an amazing two days understanding the information, the data, the ways, the visions in which school nurses can come into to help students and school, their families and school staff. I want to um, thank the panelists who will be speaking today. You've already inspired me just in short conversations. And I want to thank um, all of the researchers I met with. 
I am so enthusiastic about connecting you with NASA's Director of Research, Education, and Practice because there's good work, and some might even say good trouble, that we could get into to help students thrive. And thank you for everyone who came out in this live um, opportunity to be together and those who are uh, with us via live stream. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. I spoke to one of the panelists and talked about my renewed understanding of hospitality. It's the work that we do together for the common cause. The COVID impact on students in pre-K through 12th grade. It's been tough, it's been hard. The students are one part. I like to say students come with families. In school settings, they come with um, educators and other school staff. They come from neighborhoods. They go to healthcare providers and they are in our communities. So the recovery that's required for school students in this time as we as the public health emergency wanes is something that's for all of us. It's for all of us to be involved in, whether it is the corner grocery store, the library, the school building, the healthcare providers' offices, the hospitals, the schools. We all have a part in this. And I want to just emphasize that because this is the the kind of milieu that we will be able to have to create a circle of support for students to thrive in their, in their lives. So before I even get into some of the topics that you see that I'll talk about, school connectedness, mental health, uh, physical health and learning, I want to set the stage that we know so much about what students need. When we look from the, the midstream level, we know that students have social needs. You see it in whatever setting you practice. If families can't find the transportation to get to appointments, they won't be there. If, if students cannot um, have the, the safety and the assurance that they'd have food for the weekend, that's where schools st step in and they collaborate with community partners and they fix those backpacks that children can take home that's filled with non-perishable food that they can have for the weekend. We understand those social needs are important. We understand that they also are midstream um, opportunities to make life better for students. But I want us to understand that the social determinants of health, the work that is done to make sure that policies change so no matter where children live, learn, work, play, that they have conditions where they can thrive. Access to quality health care, access to quality education, economic stability, neighborhood and built environment that is conducive to growing. Systems level change is required. I'm grateful that we can meet social needs, but the work we're talking about are the policy changes that will make students' lives better now and into the future. And I think this is really important as we talk about this public health emergency unwinding. Um, by May, we have to make sure that there are students who have what they need. I want to speak a bit about school closures. School closures as a result of the coronavirus pandemic highlighted the essential role the schools have for students and their communities. We know that students learn best in school. We understand that. And, we have, and it's, they learn better when they have the best access to the supports they need to be healthy, safe, and ready to learn. And families and school communities also need the supports that schools provide, including referrals and access to social services. As the novel coronavirus caused schools to shut down, School nurses continue to serve students and families in schools and in communities. They didn't do it alone. There were school nurses who teamed up with food service personnel and made sure that those school meals that students had, that 
when they got breakfast at school and they got lunch at school, they were able to have that in their home and in their communities. We also know that um, there were some innovative practices that were, were accomplished because of funding. I want to tell you the story of um, uh, one school uh, system that shut down. Uh, during the shutdown, an innovative school nurse leader led a school district in using CARES Act funding to refurbish an RV, really a recreational vehicle. And they refurbished that RV to go into the communities where students and families lived. The RV, named Flo for Florence Nightingale, was staffed by school nurses and public health nurses. They brought students backpacks filled with uh, what materials that they needed to do their work at, at home. They brought those school meals that students were missing. And they did routine immunization. They were vaccinating students with those vaccines that they weren't getting because they couldn't go into the, um, the offices, the primary care offices. And they were doing mental health checks, that face-to-face, -face, looking students in the eye, looking at their families, made a difference during that time. In 2015, December of 2015, the um, administration at that time passed the Every Student Succeed, signed into law what Congress passed, the Every Student Succeeds Act. And in that education law, there was a provision for a group of professionals, specialized instructional support personnel, school counselors, school nurses, school psychologists, school social workers, librarians, physical therapists. Think of all of the supports that students need before they even get into the classroom. Those, there's a provision in our federal education law for that group of people to be available for students. And in that law, the term whole child was mentioned multiple times. And what you see before you is a visual of the whole school, whole community, whole child model that in 2014, the CDC and the Association of Supervision and Curriculum Development introduced. This whole school, whole community, and whole child model was to emphasize the collaboration of education and health for better outcomes for children. Let's look at this model for a moment. This model centers children. The child in the, the student, the child, the adolescent is in the center of this model and surrounding that student are the policies, the practices, the processes that are necessary for students to learn. And within this circle of support for students, there are 10 components, areas where policy, process, and practice can help students learn and be healthy. Those components are physical education and physical activity, nutrition environment and services, health education, social and emotional climate, physical environment, health services, counseling, psychological and social services, employee wellness, community involvement, and family engagement. And that's not all. Surrounding that group that really needs to work interprofessionally are the community agencies, the community professionals, the community that surrounds that student. We actually have a model where we can look at interprofessional, interdisciplinary care, shared leadership to be sure that students are healthy, that they're safe, that they're ready to learn. Now, I will give you a, a deeper dive into one of those components, because that's the one I know really, really well, and that's school health services. When you look at, at that whole school, whole community, whole child model, if you had a microscope 
and hovered over health services, you would see school nurses there. Also school-based health centers. But school health services, this is the framework that um, the National Association of School Nurses produced in 2016, developing this framework to guide school nursing practice, which is aligned with that whole school, whole community, whole child model. And it calls for that collaboration. So interprofessional is baked into the work that all of us need to do. It doesn't always happen that way, but the model is there for us. This framework focuses on the student, again, who's in the center of the framework, surrounded by family and school community. The framework consists of five non-hierarchical principles, care coordination, community, public health, leadership, quality improvement, and standards of practice. These principles provide an umbrella they enable all the activities that school nurses do, the implementers of the evidence that many of the researchers in this room are working on. This school nurses are able to do the work that research is showing us works for students. Now, given that frame, I want to speak about some of the areas we know have been um, have been impacted because of the school closures due to COVID. One of those areas is school connectedness. School nursing is an interesting um, profession to have in a building where most areas of students are graded in. It's an ungraded spot. It's a place where students can sometimes share more deeply about what's going on in their lives. And school nurses help students connect to their peers. Data show that when students are connected to their school, to their peers, they thrive. I can tell you the story of a student who was uh, chronically absent. She was not a student that was familiar to the school nurse, but the school nurse in, a, in an attendance review committee volunteered to reach out to that student to find out what was going on. And that student was absent primarily in her first period every day because her single parent, her mom, worked through the night and didn't get home to get her to school if she missed the bus. So why did she miss the bus? Glad you asked the question. It turns out she had arthritis and it took at least two hours for her body to unfurl after a night's sleep. Literally, the pain of her joints. And the school nurse also found out that the family did not have health insurance. So we talked about the social needs. The school nurse was able to connect with the school counselor who was able to change that first period class to a study period for her. The nurse was able to connect her with um, health insurance and connect her with a medical home. And that student was noticed and that student was seen and that student became connected to school and did not have chronic absenteeism. That's the beauty of school connectedness. That lack of feeling isolated when students are back now, um, school nurses can provide other avenues of connecting stu school students. I spoke with a school nurse in Washington who's the coach of the cross country girls team. And that was her way to connect with students who'd never come into the health room. Now for mental health. We've heard a lot about mental health. We know that there's a lot that's happening around mental health. And in this, in this state, I am so happy to be able to share with you that I am aware of work that's happening in mental health. In Holland, um, with Holland Hospital and uh, the school system, they have collaborated to provide a school nurse mental health case manager. 
You know, they're working with students who already have a diagnosis who've been treated, and they are making a difference in, in, that students, in those students' lives because, again, they're seeing, they're coming back into the school district, having uh, come out of a, a, health a health facility, and they're able to be seen, they're able to be connected, and it makes all the difference for them. When we look at the, the mental health, we also have to look at the staff. Those who are caring for students need to be healthy in their, they need mental health uh, as well and mental well-being. And it's important for us to keep that in mind. We also know that the interdisciplinary teams that I spoke about, those specialized instructional support personnel, uh, when they're school-based and they connect with those professionals outside of the school, they have some of the best outcomes for mental health for students. I'll share with you that there is a resource for um, schools as they're coming back. It's called Restart, Restart and Renew. And this is a work that was done by the National Center for School Mental Health uh, in collaboration with the uh, Connecticut Division of School of child and family. And this is a, a guide that mental health professionals can use for students. Assessments are available. You'll see the reference in, in, in my uh, slides where students can have what they need and also the adults in the building. I'll talk a little bit about um, physical health. When we think of school health services, we understand that physical health um, is part of the role, is one of the larger roles of a school nurse. And as students are coming back, schools are open, what COVID has done has made an impact on how their health is physically. First of all, there are students whose physical complaints are really connected to mental health concerns. And so school nurses in that, as trusted advisors, as ones that students will speak to and tell what's happening to them, they are able to ascertain whether the, the symptoms of stomach ache or um, headache that is not tied to any other issue, but they hear the story as they learn to implement motivational interviewing and they begin to see what some of the issues are, go are happening with students and they can be referred to those school-based mental health professionals as well. But we're also finding there are students who have long COVID and those symptoms are, again, vague. They're hard to see. Uh, the National Association of School Nurses has um, had for several years an active surveillance uh, project, a data collection project, helping uh, school nurses to know how to address chronic absenteeism so that students can be identified earlier and get the help that they need. We also know that there is already diminished access to care for a variety of reasons. We found that students in rural areas are having difficulty finding the healthcare professionals they need. Telehealth came into to a, a wonderful tool for that, but telehealth also is not the whole story. Some of these students need to be seen, and we want to make sure that, that we're advancing health equity for them. We're finding that um, the collaboration that is needed to, um, de to increase routine immunization rates there are a lot of young people and adolescents, the young children and adolescents are behind in their immunizations. School nurses have been teaming up with local health departments. The National Association of School Nurse has worked with the Association of Immunization Managers to provide education about school located clinics. So that collaboration is resulting in, in regional and local uh, immunization clinics with also um, an increase in vaccine um, confidence. One of the um, issues that we also uh, know, and I've mentioned this, is um, when we're talking about 
the physical health of students. We're talking about their food insecurity. We're talking about disordered eating. All of these are areas that have come to fore and need to be dealt with in an interprofessional way as students are back in school. And learning. We know that there have been disruptions in learning, and what do we do with that? COVID affected learning when schools closed, and there's a, a researcher who, who writes about the, the um, effects of virtual learning and hybrid learning. It made a difference for students. 34.4% of students who learned in remote or virtual settings and 30% in hybrid settings, they had decreased learning outcomes. And so being able to, to look at what they need and look at it with a, a, a lens of equity. I'll leave um, our educators to speak to that and, and share what's happening. But we do know that there are groups that we have to pay attention to. It's really important for their learning to increase. So with all of this, looking at all of that, we, we want to talk about supports for learning and behavior. Keeping that model, that whole school, whole community, whole child model in mind, there is a way that we can support uh, students. And we know that the teaching and the curriculum is one part of that. And it's beneficial when all the pieces are addressed in a coordinated effort. We want to make sure that those coordinated areas those different components of that whole school, whole community, whole child model are working together. Silos won't get to what we need. So we want to, you see this picture here, schools are using multi-tiered systems of support. And in those multi-tiered systems of support, we're able to, to provide for students at multiple levels. Universally, the population-based care that's needed, we're able to do that with this system of, of support. And then the targeted um, help that's needed, mental health programs here. Um, I know I heard of the um, uh, One Mental Health Program trails. I hope we'll hear more about that. That's making a difference here in, in, um, in this area in Michigan at, in a targeted way. And then we have students who in that tier three need more intensive support. Together we can do it. And it's school nurses, it's school teachers, it's, it's all of the, the professionals coming together and the researchers who will help those of us who are implementing in schools to be able to have the best evidence so that we can make outcomes better for students. I'm grateful to be able to share this with you today, and I look forward to um, hearing what the discussants, the panelists, will share from their specific areas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Donna, for those really thought-provoking remarks. And I think when I first invited Donna to join us today as our keynote, her first response was, well, I'm not an academic. I'm not a researcher. And I said, that is not our focus for this event. We, our, our goal is always to have someone coming from outside mm -hmm. of you know, our world and really bring a different perspective. And I think you, know, you can see why um, you bring so much value to this event today. So thank you again. Thank you. And I'd like to present you with this small token of our gratitude. Great. Thank you so Thank much. You much. Why don't you stay up here? And I'd like to invite our panelists up to the podium now as well. Thank you again for those remarks. Um, I'm delighted now to introduce our three panelists. Our first panelist will be Dr. Tiffany Munzer. Dr. Munzer is a developmental behavioral pediatrician and clinical assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics. Her clinical focus includes providing care for children with autism, ADHD, learning disabilities, and other developmental concerns. Her research focuses on how different forms of media might affect how young children and parents engage. 
and her recent research has examined the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on children with developmental and behavioral challenges who are thriving while sheltering in place. Our second panelist will be Julie Rabato, who is a clinical professor of social work at the University of Michigan. Her career has focused on parent-infant relational health and community-based programs. Rabato is a reflective supervisor consultant for individuals and groups who provide services to parents and their young children. She's involved in research as a faculty member of Zero to Thrive through the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Michigan. And our third panelist will be Dr. Donald Purek. Dr. Purek is a professor of educational policy, leadership, and innovation in the University of Michigan Marshall Family School of Education and a senior fellow at the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. His research focuses on the organization, management, and improvement of instruction and education systems with a particular focus on network-based continuous improvement. So each panelist will provide a brief set of remarks and then we'll open up for a general discussion. So please join me in welcoming our first panelist, Dr. Munzer. Thank you so much, Donna Mazik. Um, in light of all the suffering that families and caregivers and children have really experienced during the COVID-19 pandemic, it's really heartening to hear of all of the wonderful work that school nurses and teachers and um, this community really has tried to like do their best, you know, to really support and support families and center children's experiences. So thank you for sharing all of those uh, wonderful experiences with us. Um, my name's Tiffany and I'm here to share a little bit, a small slice of evidence around the COVID-19 pandemic, digital media and children's well-being. So we know that in light of the pandemic, families had to increase their screen media use uh, for a number of reasons, really truly outside of their control. Um, families reported this twofold increase in their children's screen media use during the pandemic. Uh, and pre-pandemic, they were spending, young children were spending about three hours per day on digital media across multiple different types of screens. And during the pandemic, that number increased to about six hours a day. And so children were spending an outside portion of their day using screen media. Um, we know that screen media is not, um, screen media use doesn't happen in a vacuum. It occurs in the context of children and their lived experiences and families and the stress they experience as well. Um, we know there are associations between parent stress and lower household income and greater children's screen media duration. But we know that's not the whole part of the story. Um, we know that um, children's screen media has impacts on their development in a lot of different ways, but we don't know um, as much about the content or how children are using screen media. And so the research I'm going to share today really tries to examine families' psychosocial stress, these contextual factors like parent depression or um, income or material hardships, and associations with the types of digital media that families and children are using, and then also associations with children's social and emotional well-being. In completing this research, we really found these mixed effects of digital media, that there were both positive and negative impacts uh, of digital media. So I'll start with some of the negative. When families experience more material hardships or parents experience depression, children had greater digital media use across many different types, including mobile apps and games, and they also used a little bit more streaming video, such as Netflix or YouTube. But how children were using digital media had differing effects on their well-being. So when children use highly gamified or behaviorally reinforcing media, like mobile apps and games, or video sharing platforms like TikTok, they experienced more child behavioral problems, like difficulties paying attention or conduct problems in school. We also found some of these positive impacts of digital media. For instance, when parents experience more stress, there was actually less child screen media use. And so we really think that perhaps digital media served as this, as this pop off valve and it provided some relief for parents who are facing other high acuity stress during the pandemic. We also found that 
Um, when children spent more time video chatting or on streaming apps, they actually had greater child peer competence. And so it's possible that these avenues of digital media use provided a way to practice those social skills or a ground base to connect with their peers over a shared show. So in terms of our future directions and thinking about both the positive and negative impact of digital media in the context of this psychosocial stress that families are experiencing during the pandemic, I'd like to shift to this framework from the World Health Organization. This framework really um, thinks about all of the different ingredients that are so important for young children in thriving in their communities. Things like adequate nutrition, responsive caregiving, safety and security, opportunities for early learning and good health. I think it's really important to note that COVID has upended every single aspect, every component of these critical aspects of nurturing care. And so when we think about digital media, I think it's hard to give families an ask of like one more thing to bring to their busy plates because they're burdened with all of these other things that have up been appended during the pandemic. And so in thinking about our next steps and future directions for research questions around digital media, we really need to focus on how we can shift some of that burden from the family. And so in terms of our future directions, I think some key questions include, what are some of the positive ways of using digital media that can help facilitate children's social and emotional well-being? What are the long-term impacts of digital media use and the pandemic on young children's development? And lastly, how can we better design digital media and create policies that support families instead of supporting the bottom line for digital companies? Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Hello, and thank you, Dr. Prosser, for the invitation to participate in this important event with such esteemed colleagues and panelists. Um, my remarks following the warm, caring, and informative talks by Tiffany and Donna specifically address the social and emotional needs of young children following the upheavals created by the pandemic. So there's a hidden toll of the pandemic that remains largely out of the public eye. And that is the fact that there are now approximately 10.5 million children worldwide who've lost a parent, a caregiver, or a caregiving grandparent um, to COVID or uh, to COVID-19. As of the beginning of February, it is estimated that well over 238,000 children in the US lost one or both parents or a custodial caregiver to the consequences of um, COVID-19. So there are significant long-term consequences of childhood bereavement, including an increased incidence of depression during the two years post-bereavement. About 20% of children will go on to experience serious mental health and long-term problems, including future development of depression, and that's particularly in children who lost a parent before the age of 12 and they are at a higher risk of suicidal ideation moving forward. Sudden loss is associated with an increased risk of post-traumatic stress disorder, and this is notable given the nature of the early losses where a parent or caregiver went to the, a hospital never to return. Children were often left without the social support that helps them cope. Other symptoms of bereaved children include the loss of prior attained skills and a range of feelings that leave children with fewer cognitive resources to pay attention and learn. Um, other symptoms of uh, bereaved children include loss of prior attained skills, okay, and a range of feelings that leave them with fewer cognitive resources. Their unmanaged emotions can also interfere with peer relationships and appear as behavioral issues. They can also experience psychosomatic symptoms, such as headaches and stomach aches that Donna was talking about, that can lead to an increase in school absences. It's also important to note that the long-term consequences for bereaved infants and toddlers are understudied, and so we don't know yet how those losses in the context of already taxed family systems may impact future school readiness. This is not the most uplifting talk. 
<laughs> okay. But there is a buffering effect that relationships offer. So regardless of the broader social context, such as the pandemic, um, we know that supportive, responsive parent-child relationships buffer the effects of stress on children. How caregivers fared during the shutdowns may impact children's school performance and residual challenges. Highly stressed caregivers may not have been as readily able to see and respond to their children's needs, including some of the stress, worry, and sadness that some children experienced during the shutdowns. And we already know the profound importance of teachers in providing supplemental emotional reassurance for children. So one of the things that we can think about is what was the context of the family during the COVID shutdowns? And one, one thing that we know is that when children stay in states of unalleviated pain or feelings of distress without caregivers to help them manage, they can develop toxic stress, which results in too much cortisol, a stress hormone circulating in their physiological system. Over time, this can result in reduced concentration, memory, and behavioral control. One recent study used hair cortisol samples to assess how much cortisol was in children's systems during a three -month, the three-month period of the first shutdown. They also measured children's perceptions of whether they could ask their caregiver for help with emotional distress and the caregiver's ability to be of help. They found that children who seemed most readily able to turn to and receive help from caregivers had the lowest cortisol levels. In contrast, children who seemed to least see their caregivers as a source of support had the highest cortisol levels, and that makes sense to us. We may find that the children who had the least amount of psychological support during the pandemic have prolonged challenges with re-engaging in the educational process, in part because of the ongoing stress created by neurobiological changes. This is not to blame parents, but to note that caregivers with unalleviated stress may have more challenges emotionally regulating their children, which shows up in school readiness. So there are two excellent resources readily available to the public that can help schools and communities develop programs to meet children's needs during traumatic grief. I also want to note that teachers and administrators also endured and may continue to endure enormous stress, and they need support and understanding as well. Addressing these needs now and for the foreseeable future may prevent longer-term detrimental consequences. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to contribute this afternoon and to share some perspectives from education research policy and reform. Clearly, the COVID-19 pandemic was an unparalleled interruption in the daily lives of students worldwide. On one day in March of 2020, the school bell rang and students were dismissed into a world of unimaginable uncertainty owing not only to the pandemic, but also to climate change, conflict, displacement and migration and rising demands for social justice in and through societal and government institutions. But as uncertain as that moment was, its effects on students were entirely predictable. In the United States, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, the nation's report card, showed declines in reading and mathematics with greater declines for students who were already struggling before the pandemic. In the global context, measures of learning poverty used by UNESCO, the World Bank, and others to assess students' reading comprehension showed sharp declines, especially in low and middle low income countries. Now, as students trickled back into schools, they carried, them with, they carried with them all of the negative consequences of this, not only for their academic learning, but also their social, emotional, physical, and broader personal development. And the problem is that in the United States and around the world, schools and systems have not been evolving in ways that have them well prepared to support students' needs and development holistically, the type of whole child attention that we've been hearing about. Rather, since the 1990s, the policy press on schools and systems has focused 
primarily on improving student achievement on average and reducing achievement disparities between subgroups of students with a specific focus on literacy and mathematics, a sort of technical conception of equity. And one positive de development has been the evolution of schools and systems to include new capabilities to organize, manage, and improve the day-to-day -day work of students and teachers in classroom instruction, all with an eye on ensuring their academic success. And this is the policy and the organizational frame through which many schools and many systems are responding to the pandemic. By defining the consequences for students in terms of learning loss, and by doubling down on efforts to accelerate student learning and literacy and mathematics. Now, that begs a question. Is it possible for schools and systems to sustain positive attention to students' academic development while also developing new capabilities to support their holistic development? So working with a global team of colleagues, we received funding from the Brookings Institution to investigate this question. This was in preparation for the 2022 United Nations Summit on Transforming Education last September. And this had us examining system building and rebuilding for holistic student development in seven diverse contexts, each with different conceptions of what constitutes holistic student development. This included national initiatives in Singapore, Ireland, and Chile, provincial, territorial, and local initiatives in British Columbia, India, and the US, and one cross-national initiative, the International Baccalaureate. And we found evidence of possibility. Across contexts, we saw evidence of schools and systems shifting work that they had been doing to support academic development to also support more holistic student development. And their attention was focused squarely on doing this work in classrooms. This included developing new designs and infrastructure for classroom instruction, integrating these designs and this infrastructure into the day-to-day -day work of students and teachers in classrooms, carefully monitoring classroom instruction and providing targeted formative uh, um, assistance to both students and teachers to reenact their new roles in new ways, engaging families and communities in new ways, and developing new leadership capabilities to support all of the proceeding. In contrast to a technical conception of equitable, equitable treatment of students. This was deeply morally grounded work. And these categories of work played out consistently in initiatives that otherwise varied in terms of their level of operation within systems, local, provincial, territorial, national, international, the unique historical, social, and policy contexts in which schools operated and in which these initiatives were taking root, and their different understandings of and ambitions for holistic student development. Now, there's much more to say about this than I can say right now, but clearly there's also much more that needs to be done to understand, support, and evaluate the work of transforming schools and systems in these ways to support holistic student development, especially in ways responsive to the consequences of the pandemic especially in policy and local contexts that continue to define the problem of students in terms of their learning loss and doubling down on the need to improve their performance in literacy and mathematics. So even so, from our work, we find this evidence as hopeful um, with a sustained policy press over decades, as has been the case with this press on literacy and mathematics, we see this present moment as a potential marker of a next era in education reform in which schools and systems are more fully attentive to both the academic and the holistic development of students. Thank you. Thank you so much to our panelists for providing those three unique perspectives on this question and at very different levels of scale and scope and setting. And we're looking forward to a very robust discussion, but thank you again to all of you. Um, we would love to open this up now for um, a general discussion. And so we have two um, 
uh, two microphones that are available in the audience. I have a number of questions that um, many attendees submitted beforehand, so thank you for those questions. And for those of you that are joining us virtually, you're also able to contribute um, through the chat, so please feel free to submit questions there as well. So I'd like to start um, with one question um, uh, to Donna, Tiffany, and potentially whoever else would like to answer as well. What do you see as the potential benefits of school-based healthcare programs in developing and implementing programs to diminish the negative impacts of school closure on our children? Thank you for that, um, for that question. I think that what we do need to do is first of all, um, make sure that students know that, that we are well. You know, they feel that. The administrators have had a heavy load, the educators, everyone, um, even to the bus drivers. So making sure that there are, uh, that it's an environment where there's health and wholeness. And so I mentioned the Restart and Renew um, uh, program, and I think that it, it supports students return to school. It uh, enables um, certain programs that are uh, evidence-based, like CBITS and Bounce Back, um, mm -hmm. enabling um, uh, schools to, to really work with their uh, mental health providers and school partners. And the toolkit includes um, three areas to extend uh, supports to, mm -hmm. to students. So screening is important. You need to know where folks are and uh, checking in with students. Being able to support educators, as I mentioned, as school restarts is so important. And, um, and I think that that will at least provide a beginning way to, to let them reenter. Well, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, that's a great answer. And I think, um, you know, in thinking about some of the clinical work that we do and the importance of school for children's health, um, it makes perfect sense that schools and the clinical team are you know, important collaborators and partners in thinking about centering the child's perspective. And so I think programs that really strengthen that collaboration and connection are really important. Programs like the TRAILS program that you mentioned, Donna, which really uh, helps implement these evidence-based um, mental health and social emotional programs within the school system. Programs like the Regional Health Alliance for Schools, which really increases that connection between access for students who might not otherwise be able to get to their appointments, you know? And so I think that any way we can strengthen those ties is really important um, and will have a strong impact on children's well-being. Terrific, thank you. Um, any questions um, from the audience here? Okay, then we'll start with the, uh, oh, is there one? One online? Okay, great. So the question online is, schools use developmental hallmarks in so many ways. Given that the shutdown so affected socio-emotional development trajectories, how should school staff, particularly those who develop programming and curricula, recalibrate our understanding of the developmental continuum? Thank you. Who would like to start? We have to begin with where the students are. So knowing where students are, that recalibration can, can come into play. Like where are they now? And where is their trajectory? Where do we want them to go? And I think that's, that's one of the key first steps. Thank you. Go ahead. To, to follow on, that was exactly what I was thinking, Donna, is um, then to turn to the folks who know children at younger developmental ages for guidance on what they would be doing at a younger developmental age to promote a skill set. So not looking at kids' chronological age, but actually looking at their developmental ages and using the folks who understand that developmental age to promote best practice. Great, thank you both. I'm gonna follow up that question um, for Julie and any others. Um, is there a sensitive period in which the effects of school closures had a greater adverse impact on school outcomes? And relatedly, did school closures adversely impact younger children, preschool or early school age to a greater degree than older children? 
So I have a couple of thoughts and a couple of different directions on this. Um, yeah. One of the things that I've been hearing a lot from parents is that they experience profound concern that their zero to three year olds were lacking socialization opportunities. And what would this mean for them moving forward? And I've checked with other colleagues to make sure that this isn't just my take. Babies and young children do not need, do not need socialization with other children. They can benefit from it, they might enjoy it, but that what they need is socialization with invested caregivers. They need experiences of being loved and delighted in and seeing as unique and learning about their emotion language and, and their worlds. So it, when families were in contexts that were supportive enough, those children are likely being doing fine. They, where we see some challenges, I think, is when we expected children to return without the same level of understanding of the process of separation that, we, what, that is normative, right? So a two or three-year-old coming into preschool for the first time, we expect them to show distress. We expect them to have a few days of challenge. But folks that were ready who, who knew three and four year olds, but who knew them as children who grew up in childcare or children who had already been in preschool programs and had already been socialized, they had the same expectations for those children moving back in. And childcare programs were not well situated for easy transitions. And so one of the ways that I think that this might play out later on down the line is for some children, that became such um, a, a felt traumatic event, that sudden separation and perhaps lack of support, that we could see challenges in the future around beginning of the school year, return back from vacations, return from a week off because of an ice storm. So we really have to be thinking developmentally about what children need during separations, transitions, and reunions. Great, thank you. Any other comments on that question? Okay, great. Questions? Great, thank you. David Sandberg, um, I work in cheer. Thank you all very much. Um, I have um, a question uh, regarding the role of school nurses, other educators. Um, in healthcare, uh, I, I deliver uh, healthcare to, to children and adolescents with chronic medical conditions. They'll miss school. Uh, they'll have altered cognitive function by virtue of the medical condition or its treatment. And I speak to colleagues around the country and internationally, there doesn't seem to be a way to liaise with schools in a meaningful way to take the information that we have. We'll do neuropsychological testing, which is meaningless in a school environment that is focused on just grades. Many of the needs of these children are social emotional. They've missed school. They find difficulties in social communication, friend, developing friendships. And so, so that's more of a comment, which I, I'd be interested in your thoughts. And, and then I, I have to say, as uh, I started off as a hard-nosed researcher in a laboratory animal research and, and now doing very different clinical research. What I, the rigidness of my thinking uh, gets me frustrated with the fact that there is so much science, so much evidence that tells us which way to go. And even stronger than that is the will to ignore all of it. So, I guess it's an implementation question. How do we take the good science and evidence that we have right now and implement, not in pilot projects, but to bring about systemic change? Thank you. Go ahead. So saving the last for last, so I can think about it while I answer the first stuff. Um, one of the things that's difficult for people who don't study schools and educational systems as organizations to really understand 
is how underdeveloped they are as organizations. For much of the history of US public education and still in many places around the world, the primary problem being dealt with is providing access to schooling, access to instruction, getting more and more, more and more diverse students into schools and into classrooms. This continues to be a huge problem and it's one that's being currently politically challenged in the United States. It's only in the 1980s that there was a Supreme Court decision that really affirmed the right of all students, all children in the United States, including undocumented immigrated, immigrant students, to actually go to school. Now that's being challenged. So, so much of the work of public schooling up into the 1980s 